I'm a cam girl, and one of my clients is freaking me out. I've not been a cam girl for long, only 6 months or so. I have no trauma in my past that has led me into this kind of work. Quite simply, I enjoy it. Or at least, I did. You meet all kinds of people with all kinds of fetishes. I've had some clients who have requested things I have been uncomfortable with, and I have simply declined and blocked them. The website I work for looks after us, and makes sure we never feel we have to do anything we are uncomfortable with. Usually, though, people are quite normal. Some people want to see my feet, some people want me to sit in an oversized t-shirt, and pretend to be their girlfriend, some people want a standard show. People find my profile through the website and they pay per minute. Some people only ever call once, but some people end up becoming regulars and I get to know what they like. I've been in some strange situations, but on the whole, I like my job and I like my clients. One client, who I will call Jason, has been calling me every few days or so since I started. He was one of my first clients. Jason, like many of my clients, chooses not to turn on his video or microphone. He types to me, while I sit on video, and talk back to him. A lot of men who use the services are quite lonely, and so chatting non-sexually is not unusual, but Jason has literally never asked me to do anything sexual and declines when I offer. Each to their own, I've always thought. Jason's wife left him last year and he's been finding it hard. I went through a breakup myself in January, and although I was glad to be out of that relationship, because my boyfriend had not treated me well, I know it can be strange to adjust to being alone, so I felt genuine sympathy and a connection to him. Yesterday afternoon, at the usual time, Jason's call came through. Hey baby, he typed. Hi, sexy, I said. How are you doing today? Good. You? All good baby i'm wearing something special for you today wanna see just talk he typed back i knew he would say that but i always feel i should offer how's your day been i asked leaning back into the chair and relaxing the call was likely to go on for over half an hour and i quite liked that i was important enough to be the person who heard how he was feeling when clearly he had nobody in real life he could open up to Jason's day had not been good. He missed his wife a lot, and he wanted to get her back. He wanted my advice on how to approach her, and what he could say, and how he could convince her that he would be a better husband now. I felt a bit protective of Jason, and although I didn't want to piss him off, I tried to tell him that he needs to find a woman who wants him, and values him for who he is, and he doesn't need to change to be with someone who doesn't really want him. You mean a woman like you, he typed. Then he added, how can you possibly be single? This is where it gets tricky. I try not to reveal too much about my personal life, and usually direct the conversation back to the client. After all, they are paying, and it is their time. I also need them to understand that it is a service they are paying for, and I'm not, in fact, their girlfriend, although it's fine if we role play as such on the call. Having that boundary is easier and fairer to everyone when I haven't confided in them. You need to find someone who you like who likes you. Someone who makes you feel special. You make me feel special, he typed. Thanks, baby, I said. You will find someone soon, I know it. I wanted to change the subject as I felt quite uncomfortable. I knew that, if this carried on, I would need to remind him that this was just roleplay, and that we weren't actually in any way together, but obviously that was quite a mood killer, and I didn't want to upset him. I have this chat with all of my clients in the beginning, when they first reach out to me. I go over boundaries, how it all works the types of things I offer, find out what they like, and discuss whether I'm the right person for them. I didn't want to bring up the I'm not really your girlfriend chat again unless completely necessary. After all, it was their time and they were paying for this role play. Luckily, he changed the topic and we chatted a little about his work and other mundane stuff for a few minutes. 
Where's the picture gone? He eventually said. What picture? The one on the wall. I frowned. I'd taken down the canvas picture on the wall earlier that day. I'd never really liked it. Recently, I'd decided that now I was single, I should make the most of the fact that I can decorate the apartment in any way I want. So I'd taken down the art I didn't like, ordered some more, and even bought myself a zebra print rug. How do you know it was there? I said. The picture had been on the wall facing me, and it would never have been visible on my webcam. Mirror. Shit. I had to look close to see, but in my background, you could see the mirror behind me, and presumably, he'd been able to see the picture in the reflection. He must have damn good eyesight or a really big screen. I tried to subtly look around, to figure out what else my clients might have been able to see this whole time. My webcam faced the wall, and I'd positioned myself like that on purpose. I didn't want them to see anything personal of mine, including my apartment or any of my stuff in it. Even though I was regularly getting naked, them seeing my home felt like a weird invasion of privacy. I made a mental note to sort out the mirror later and tried to carry on with small talk. It was probably a bit strange to him that I'd gotten weirded out by a simple comment, but I think I managed to recover the situation. He hung up soon after that, and I pushed it out of my mind. I went for a bath after that and got changed. I'd arranged to go on a date. It would be the first date I'd been on since my breakup, and I was nervous. His name was Carl, and I met him at the library, where he helped me to find a book. A real meet cute. Not like most of the guys who I'd dated who I met at 3am at the club. We met for dinner and drinks. And the date went well. Very well in fact. Because of my nervousness, the wine went down a little too well, and I soon found myself in that very slightly hazy state where everything in the world is good. I stopped drinking then, not wanting to embarrass myself, and he followed my lead. We talked for hours about our lives and our interests. He was smart. He was interested in me. Truth be told, at one point in my life, I may have described him as boring, but he wasn't. He was just someone who was open about what he was looking for, and wanted to meet someone who was like-minded. It was me who kissed him. He looked taken aback initially, but then kissed me back. It was sweet. He walked me home at the end of the date, and as he turned to leave, I called out after him, Do you want to come inside? We sat on the couch, and watched a movie. Actually, we watched about a third of the movie. When things started getting heated, he stopped to ask me if I was sure, and told me he was happy to wait. He was so sweet, and although I hadn't planned to have Essex on the first date, I wanted him right then more than I'd ever wanted anyone. We didn't even make it to the bedroom. We did it right there on the couch. Carl cared about pleasuring me. It wasn't just a race to the finish line. When Mr. Scruffles, my cat, decided to try to hop on the couch with us at one point, he just laughed. I was smitten already. I fell asleep, in a state of utter bliss. We had coffee together this morning, and he left for work. I hadn't told him I was a cam girl yet. Maybe that was wrong. I was just so worried that he wouldn't be okay with it, and telling people on a first date seemed like a bad idea. I had batted off the question with some vague comment and told him I worked from home, which was technically true. After showering and doing my makeup, I logged on, ready to work, feeling a bit strange after last night about the fact I was about to talk to the men I was about to talk to in the way I was about to talk to them. Ah well, I thought to myself. A girl's gotta work. A girl's gotta eat. Jason called me, which was odd, since we had spoken yesterday. Normally it was just once every few days. Hey baby, I said. How are things going today? You're a fucking SL asterisk T, he typed. I froze. What the duck? He never spoke like that. Some people said stuff like that in the middle of dirty talk, but it had never been like that with Jason. Before I could say anything, he was typing again. You loved his big duck, didn't you? You're ducking disgusting. 
I ended the call immediately and blocked him. How had he known? I looked around, completely confused and then I got up, to pace around the room. Literally, the only person I told that I was going on a date was my best friend Karen, and the only person who knew that I had slept with Cole was Carl. My eyes darted around the room and rested on my laptop. I'd heard about webcams being hacked, but I wasn't sure how he could have done it. The website I worked for was secure. How would he have accessed it? I didn't know much about technology, and an internet search gave me a lot of stuff that was too technological for me to understand, as well as some dramatic and scary news articles. I wasn't sure what to think. I decided, on advice from the internet, to tape over it. I felt completely freaked out, and violated and was in no mood to carry on with clients anyway, so I decided to take a day off for myself. I could make up for it by working more next week if I needed to. I went to the gym and then decided to meet Karen for lunch. While Karen knows I'm a cam girl, I decided not to tell her about what happened with Jason this morning. She did not approve of my new job for precisely the reason that she thought it might be dangerous if one of my clients was a psycho and I couldn't bear to get an I told you so when I explained that my webcam had been potentially hacked by a client. I did, however, tell her about Carl and our date. S asterisk X on the first date, he said, feigning shock. Look at you. Good for you girl, you get yours. She spent the next half an hour wanting to hear your details and I laughed at her. We chatted for a while over lunch, and when she went to pick her kid up from football, I decided that I wasn't ready to go home yet. I stopped by the nail salon, got myself a manicure and a pedicure, and by the time that I arrived home to find flowers on my doorstep, I had almost forgotten about Jason. Thank you for the flowers, I texted Carl. I was glad I was alone, because I was grinning from ear to ear like a teenager. He sent back an embarrassed face. That was a weird response but never mind. I messaged him again, telling him I was about to cook my famous chili, that is a recipe printed off from a website, if he wanted to join me, and he responded that he'd be over in an hour. By the time he arrived, things in the kitchen were not going well. The chili was getting dry and sticking to the pan, and I ran to open the door for him, with barely time for a hello, before I had to rush back into the kitchen to rescue dinner. There's wine on the table, I shouted through to the living room. Make yourself at home. I'm just seasoning. Smells good, he said. You got a secret admirer. Huh. I added too much water to the chili. Now it was too watery. The flowers, he said. Very funny, I said. Thank you for those. They're beautiful. They're not from me, he said. I turned off the heat and walked into the living room. What do you mean? I said. I didn't send you flowers. When you messaged earlier, I thought you were saying I should have sent you flowers, and I felt bad. That's weird, I said. Then who? What the duck? He interrupted me, pulling out a card that I hadn't seen, that had been buried inside the flowers. His face went white as he handed it to me. Written on it, in big black letters, was, Roses are red. Violets are blue. You cheap dirty SL asterisk T. I'll duck in K asterisk LLU. It felt like time stopped, as I stared at it, reading it over and over. It was Jason. It had to be. But how could he possibly know where I lived? I called Karen, and she came over immediately. I told them both everything. Cole was shocked, and said he wished I had told him, but he was more concerned with making sure I'm okay. I'm really worried that this guy knows where I live, and might be dangerous, so I'm going to stay with Karen tonight, and she thinks I should contact the police in the morning. I woke up in the morning, although I don't know if I slept at all, and Karen brought me coffee. Like some of you guys, she was instantly suspicious of Carl. So all of this happened just as this amazing, perfect guy happens to show up in your life, she said. It just doesn't make sense, I said. 
Why would he call me a slut after I'd slept with him and carry on wanting to see me? Psychos will be psychos. He's probably playing some weird sick game and getting off on it, she said. I'm telling you, he's too good to be true. I didn't want to believe it, but I got a sinking feeling inside me. Carl called me a few times in the morning and I didn't answer. What was I supposed to say? Hey Carl, thanks for being there for me last night when I dropped this bombshell on you, but are you by any chance my stalker? The police showed up an hour after I called them and came with me to my apartment. They are taking it seriously, but people around here aren't as progressive as they are in some places. Is that like a P asterisk R N S T A R? One of the police officers said. He was grinning. I wanted to punch him in the face. No, I'm a webcam model. What, like you do fashion shows? I sighed. Clients call me, and I perform S asterisk X U A L acts, and speak to them in a S asterisk X U A L way. Or sometimes not in a S asterisk X U A L way, like in the case of Jason. So you're like one of those phone S asterisk X lines, but with the video, one of them said. He looked as though he was simply amazed to find out that this existed, and his face told me that, as soon as he got home he was going to thoroughly research it. Is this even relevant? I said. I was getting irritated. I had told them that someone had threatened me, and they seemed more concerned with finding out the intricate details of what exactly I do on webcam. They rolled their eyes and exchanged judgmental looks with each other. Their interjections meant that it took quite a lot of time to actually tell the story, and by the end, I was drained. They told me that they would need to take my laptop and were going to contact the website I work for to see if they can find out more about him. Then they told me that a team would come shortly to do a sweep of the house for any listening or recording devices. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was giving the officers a list of people who had been inside my apartment recently when the sweep team knocked on the door and I answered to see my ex-boyfriend and one of his colleagues and my heart nearly stopped. If I ever thought I was going to bump into him, I'd have hoped it would be at the bar when I'm dressed up and looking sexy, being all independent and having drinks with the girls. Not when I was in two big clothes that I'd borrowed from Karen before I left her house that morning, my face red and blotchy because I was being stalked by a client from my new Cam Gerald business. He didn't let on to the police officers that he knew me and I was grateful that he remained professional. One of the reasons we broke up is because he was quite controlling and possessive and was constantly convinced I was cheating on him. I didn't want to deal with him right then. Besides, the police officers would probably have a field day hearing all about it. I know it's common to want to be the one who is winning after a breakup, but when I looked at my ex, and he looked at me, I definitely didn't seem to be the one who was winning. He just looked at me with this awful pitying and disgusted look on his face. They found three hidden cameras in the apartment. I'd known it was a possibility, and I'd suspected my webcam had been hacked, but the fact they had been planted in my apartment made me sick to the stomach. Somebody who had been here did this. My mind instantly went to Carl again, but I pushed the thought out. He was on the short list of people who had been in my apartment within the last three months, and so the police would investigate him as well as the others. They told me they would look into whether they can find out who installed them. Apparently there might be fingerprints, or whatever other ways, to track the person down. When they left, they advised me not to stay at my apartment while they were investigating, so I grabbed some clothes, emptied Mr. Scruffle's litter box, filled up several bowls of food and water for him, and called his name. No answer. That was weird. He always came running when there was food. I called him again. No tapping of little claws on the floor. I tried to remember if I'd seen him at all since I'd gotten back to my apartment and I hadn't. I started freaking out then. I went to look in his favorite hiding spots and with every place I checked, my heart pounded faster and faster. 
he wasn't here. Could he have got him out, said one of the police officers. He's an indoor cat, I said. And he's old. He doesn't go out, and there's no way for him to get out. My blood ran cold. They helped me search the apartment until finally, we had to accept that he was, in fact, gone. Rage rose up inside me. It was Carl. I cried. He must have broken in, and taken him and Anne. Words poured out of my mouth like vomit. I ranted at them about how it was so strange, that he'd come into my life, so perfect, just as all of this happened. At this point, I was completely and absolutely certain, that he was my stalker. Did you give Carl a key? They said. No, he must have broken in. There aren't any signs of a break in. Are you sure your cat didn't just get out? You know, when cats are close to death, they are known to want to be alone and sometimes run away. I wasn't even listening. I couldn't breathe. Who would take someone's cat? Why would he want Mr. Scruffles? What sick game was he playing? A police officer took me back to Karen's and told me that they would update me as soon as possible. They reassured me that they would question Carl, but at this point, I was so convinced that it was him that I was practically shouting at them to go and get him, lock him up, and throw away the key. It was only when I arrived at Karen's house that I realized I may have made a mistake. When we got there, she was hysterical. She had left that morning when I did, to drop off her son at school, and take her husband to his hospital appointment. When she came home, she found a note stuck to her door, which said, You and your crippled husband need to mind your own business. Pinned under the note was a picture of their son from the weekend at his football practice. Absolute horror and guilt washed over me. I had gotten her involved in this and now she was being threatened too. Carl has met Karen, but he doesn't know anything about her husband or her son, nor does he know where she lives. I don't know how he could have found out, and it was then, that I had to consider, that it may not be him after all. You can't stay here, he said eventually. She looked as though it caused her tremendous pain to say it. Her face was white, and she was shaking. I'm so sorry, I really am. That psycho might hurt our boy. I can't. I understood, of course, I did. Would I really react differently, if I was her? Karen and I have been friends for years and the last thing I wanted was to put her in danger. I don't know what to do or who to trust. I can't think and I just keep going over everything in my head. I don't want to reveal any details about where I'm now in case Jason somehow sees this, but I'm safe for now. The police can't find him. They went to his house and he's not there. It's definitely him though. I woke up this morning to a message from a number one didn't recognize. It said, this has gotten out of hand. I still love you, sissy. He was the only one who ever called me that. I always hated it. It felt like a little girl's name. I left him because his behavior became too much. He expected me to look at the floor when we were out and didn't want me to talk to other men. He hated all of my friends. He always told me they were a bad influence on me, and I shouldn't see them anymore. He believed that, since we had each other, we didn't need anyone else. Of course, his friends were an exception, because they were good guys. He was never violent though. He never hurt me. I can't believe he would torment me the way he has. When I broke up with him, he was devastated. He dropped to his knees and begged me not to leave, but I told him I had to do what was best for me. I told him that if he loved me, he needed to let me go because I wasn't happy. I thought he understood. All of the leads that the police followed have come up with dead ends, but they think they can mail him with this message. He has no way of knowing where I am, but they are sending an officer around to stay with me as a precaution. It's been 20 minutes since I called them, and even though I'm safe here, I hope they arrive soon. I've become really paranoid. Every time I hear a tiny noise, I jump. Earlier, I heard a tap on the window and I spilled my scalding hot coffee all over me. It was just a tree branch tapping. I've not slept. 
Since all of this started, I can't eat anything. I keep getting these surges of panic wash over me and anything I eat comes straight back up again. You hear about these things happening, but you never think they will happen to you. I never thought that someone I knew, and that someone I once thought I loved, could put me through this. I keep hoping that there's somehow a mistake and it's just some random crazy guy. I just want them to find him and arrest him so I can live my life. I feel so guilty that I didn't trust Carl. He's been nothing but good to me. I tried to call him today but there was no answer. I know I haven't known him long, but I felt something special with him, and I hope that when this is over, we can have a proper second date. It's funny that it was only days ago that we had our first date and I came home feeling better than I had in a very long time. That's the door. We'll update later, after I've spoken to police. You all really thought I would hurt the cat, didn't you? I'm not a monster. I'm the one who bought her that cat, and it was supposed to be ours. Apparently, moving to a new apartment would stress him out is a perfectly good reason to keep him for herself after we broke up. I would never hurt Mr. Scruffles, a ridiculous name, if you ask me, poor, emasculated little guy, but of course she always got her way, I just wanted him back, the same way I just wanted her back. I wanted us to be family again. That is the thing that you are not understanding. I loved her, despite her flaws. I always thought she looked peaceful when she was sleeping. Controlling and possessive, it has been quite amusing to read her ridiculous version of events. She has always been childlike and impulsive, always desperately seeking validation wherever she can, even with strangers on the internet. She always needed looking after, like a child. I tried to look after her, because I loved her. I did not want her to get into a dangerous situation. She never understood what men are really like. She always said I was paranoid, but I know I'm not. I saw the way she looked at my friends. Of course, they looked at her back, but who could blame them? They are men. I had to make sure nobody took her from me, but she did not help things. She would always look at them for a second too long. She would wear revealing outfits when they came over. Whenever I left the room to get drinks, I would hear her in there with them, giggling like a teenager. It did not even matter if their wives were with them. She was shameless. And then when I walked back in, it would stop, and her eyes would drop to the floor as she was caught red-handed. It is embarrassing you know, being treated like that in front of all my friends. And when I got angry, everyone in the room would get uncomfortable and leave, and it was all because of her. I loved her anyway. I loved her despite all that. And finally, she betrayed me. One day I came home from work, and she said she couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't do what? Love me? How can you just stop loving someone? She made me move out of her apartment and suddenly it was over out of nowhere. I would have done anything to get her back. I wanted to show her how much I love her. It is true what they say isn't it? You could get a pizza delivery faster than the police. I put the cameras in months before we even broke up. I'm sure you understand why. Now I have explained everything. I needed to make sure she did not do anything wrong when I was not there. Of course, she had a real job back then. I would never have allowed her to become an online prostitute, but I could not be with her all of the time. It is quite addictive to watch someone when they do not know that you are watching. When you watch someone behaving in the way that they do, when they think they are completely alone, you really know them in a way that nobody else does. Of course, she is not the brightest. She had not even considered it might be me until you all told her. You kind of ruined the rest of my plan, by the way. Thank you for that. Oh well. Plans change. Admittedly, it is kind of cute that she thought I would not find her here. How can you hide from someone who knows everything about you? I watched her after we broke up, and she did not even seem sad about it at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. And of course, she set up that ridiculous webcam stuff. 
It is disgusting when someone you love is whoring themselves out for anyone with a credit card. I was not lying to her. Maybe my name is not Jason, and maybe I changed a couple of details, but everything else was true. When I was Jason, she liked me. I just needed a little more time, and then I was going to tell her who I really was. I had it all planned out, and she was going to realize she still loved me, and come right back to me. She would stop talking to all those other men online and I would have her back. That is, of course, until that pathetic excuse for a man. Well, I saw all of it. I saw what she did with him, right on the couch. The couch that we had spent so much time together on. I saw how much she enjoyed it. How much she enjoyed someone she barely even knew. He is not even good looking. Well, he certainly is not anymore. I dealt with him, because I had to. It was nothing personal. I'm not a bad person, you see. I just love her so much, that I cannot cope with not having her. I cannot allow her to belong to somebody else. It is quite cathartic, to tell your story, isn't it? I guess I can see, why she liked doing this. The police have finally arrived. I suppose they will be wanting to speak with me. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. Hit like and subscribe for more videos.